Tristan, welcome. Good to see you, David. Good to be here with you. Yeah. So the reason we're talking is because you've done a lot of work on the dynamics of social media. People may be aware of the Social Dilemma film that you starred in and was about kind of how social media was basically kind of weaponizing our vulnerabilities and um, that there's a kind of arms race within within tech. And I'd love to kind of explore with you kind of how it feels from the other side as a creator. Because yeah. my experience and the kind of trajectory of the last few years as a creator on YouTube, having come from kind of legacy mainstream media and moving over to, to the alternative, is that these these forces are even more accelerated on creators. Mm -hmm. And I felt that very kind of viscerally myself and also seen a lot of creators kind of, I would say, kind of become more radicalized, become more extreme, go down particular rabbit holes. And it's sort of been really striking to see mm -hmm. this effect. Um, yeah, and we've talked a bit offline, so what do, what do you make of the, the that, that side of things? Well, cause now creators are the source of their own reputational credibility. You know, you're pegged with one profile, so and you're getting personalized feedback of how many likes and followers I get down to, you know, each minute based on how often I'm tweeting. Like, so the feedback loops, as you're saying, are tighter. I feel like we've moved into the more industrialized age of of this attention machine. Like journalists might be vaguely aware, say before social media even existed, that when I made this video, oh, like that got some buzz. A lot of people were talking about that, but you didn't have the industrialized machine that had perfect measurement about which audiences, how many comments, when those comments came in, how many likes did you get for that specific tweet versus for this other specific tweet. So everyone becomes their own kind of, re you know, tuning fork that's just a B testing, like a Frank Lund's dial testing machine back in, you know, the polling, political polling days, each person can kind of A B test if I say it this way versus if I say it this way, if I title the video that way, if I put a red circle in YouTube around an object in the video thumbnail, that gets a lot more traffic. And there's whole, as you know, probably that there's these, these whole dark web sort of services that, um, you can pay to help viralize your, your content. And that machine is basically appealing to this this algorithm behind the scenes. And if YouTube changes that algorithm or changes the basis of what gets recommended, I think part of the conversation you and I were having earlier is that the fundamental social physics underneath the world have changed, but we haven't talked about that. And so much like, you know, um, we would assume uh, pre Copernicus that, you know, the uh, sun rotated around the earth and then we sort of updated our model. I think the assumptions that we've had around um, the, sor the sources of power in society and how they're influenced, social media and the algorithm, if it gets tweaked, it downstream affects how creators work, how politicians will act, mm -hmm. how um, journalists will act, how children will act. People will go to, t children will go to a, um, a business and take an Instagram photo just to say that they were there and then they leave. Mm -hmm. These dynamics are all you know, as the, as the social fabric of society is moving, it's shifting based on design decisions that are made by individuals at, at tech companies. Yeah. And it feels like things are going backwards. Um, certainly when at the beginning of Rebel Wisdom was focusing on a few things that felt quite hopeful, like the, the intellectual dark web phenomenon right. when it was first announced, it was like I said, a podcasters, is it possible to have an emergent internet phenomenon where people are having good faith conversations right. based on truth and kind of or pretty much the the morality tale of almost all of those people has been for me kind of quite the lots of relationships have fractured lots of the individuals within it i think have become more reactionary or more reactive in many many ways and like that kind of sense of it feels like we're more and more boxed in and especially the audience dynamics mm -hmm. which again I, I said i like felt viscerally like the fact that we've got a comment thread the fact that kind of that, that there is this sort of feedback loop. I think, I feel it kind of viscerally pulling me and I've seen my experiences that it can warp the world around you in a way that is almost imperceptible, right. like these sort of gravitational forces. Um, and it's fascinating to me to look at how it, it genuinely does feel like we've gone backwards over the last sort of four or five years and I, I feel like the technologies and the are, are kind of intrinsically part of that picture. Do you want to say more about those dynamics? Because like when you started Rebel Wisdom, it was basically mm -hmm. here's the mainstream establishment sense making apparatus, yes. and you're saying our our means of sense making are breaking down, but yeah. we don't have good alternatives, 
And the beauty of something like YouTube and social media is that new sources of authority or new ways of sense making can actually emerge, whereas before they've been gate kept. Everybody knows the gatekeeping story. Yeah. And at the beginning, rebel wisdom uh, was, you're saying, like, mm -hmm. And it had an ability to bring out these other figures, these other voices that had meaningful things to share about mm -hmm. the state of society. Mm -hmm. But what, for people who aren't tracking what's shifted over time, mm -hmm. like what is, what's actually shifted? Like you're saying we've regressed in a way. What do you mean? What started, and Rebel Wisdom was very much kind of, as you'd imagine from the name, kind of focused on the critique of the mainstream. Right. There's an essential critique of a mainstream perspective, a kind of naive, naive liberalism, a sort of tribalism that pretends it's not a tribalism. And that particularly during the pandemic, I found the, the kind of heterodox space get more and more reactively contrarian. Mm -hmm. Like whatever the man is saying, we're for the opposite. So, I mean, if, I think people wouldn't necessarily... The premise of the sort of IDW and rebel wisdom and this kind of category of media is the independence of the worldview that you're offering. Like we're not beholden to the forces of the mainstream media who won't tell you, like, here's some new ways we can look at the world. But what we're sort of talking about now are ways that invisibly you are beholden to something else that, you know, the mainstream media is beholden to the masters of the establishment class. Yes. But you're basically saying we're beholden to the algorithm, which is kind of what happened to IDW writ large, is it started yes. off with a critique of the social justice or, or woke side. Yeah. And then I would imagine based on these incentives, they were just like, wow, that really works. So we're just going to keep offering more content because yeah. we're giving people what they want because the clicks represent the what they want. But the what they yeah. want was determined by the YouTube algorithm, which mm. was sorting for characteristics. Yeah. So it's not what they want. It's what the YouTube algorithm recommended. And yeah. if you change that algorithm to people... Um, um, posting content that would actually unify different tri like um, clusters of users who previously liked very different universes of YouTube content. Imagine the algorithm rewarded that which caused a positive sentiment comment mm. from different tribes who never overlap. Yeah. And then it, giving what they want, giving them what they want would then mean I'm giving the YouTube algorithm the new thing that it wants, which is more weird consensus across tribes. Mm. And so I think the, the confusion is in the language of we're giving people what they want when really we were actually serving the God algorithm master mm. and YouTube can tweak that algorithm and it, and it has this effect. Mm. Yeah. The, the fascinating thing as you're talking about the kind of the, the topography of it is what I don't think a lot of people watching realize when they're sort of like, um, and obviously I'm self-reflective enough to be like, so what are my blind spots? What are the things that maybe I'm kind of too aligned with? Um, conventional narratives and I want to question and kind of be open to. So there's kind of that dimension right. as well. But the interesting thing is we, we featured, for example, Eric Weinstein talking about the, the, how a lot of institutions, truth seeking institutions get captured by commercial incentives. And it's like, that's absolutely true. And I think a lot of people, especially the audience in the more contrarian heterodox space are aware of this and social media enforces conformity around certain kind of topics and will censor other topics and, like they're super aware of how that kind of conformity is enforced. Right. I think they're less aware of the fact that they themselves the are algorithm. part, well, they're part of another, another influence on the creator. So you kind of see that in the, in the comments thread of like, no, that comment thread itself, like the weight of, the weight of opinion. And what you, what people I don't think also understand is like, they're not necessarily seeing a cross section of, a, a consensus of opinion, what they're seeing is a consensus of opinion within this particular algorithmic bubble. The, the thing you're saying about comments and the first comment, like the top rated comment, it's an influential one because it steers, if you get the first couple comments to be, to be moving in one direction, it influences what the rest of the people mm. think. And um, in studying Twitter, one of the things we know about how actually like Russian bots usually manipulate Twitter or Russian mm. troll farms is that you want to win the first spot after the tweet so that if Trump says something, you want your tweet to be the, the top one underneath it. Cause then you, Trump reaches how many people like hundred million people are used to, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're underneath him and you only had 20 followers for your account, your 20 followers still got you to the top of the underneath the guy with a hundred million. So that's going to mm -hmm. appear to everybody who clicks on that thread. And so, and, and what they used to do is the, the technique was we work in threes. So mm -hmm. you would have, um, three trolls go and comment first something positive, then someone who questioning the positive thing, and then having the third guy actually resolve it in the direction that they wanted the social conformity to go. 
Mm. Um, because the idea is if we could create the conflict and then resolve it in the way we want it to go, then we can steer the social conformity bias. Wow. Um, and of course, in general, humans are very persuaded by what other people around them appear to be thinking, mm. um, even though we don't think that we are. Uh, and the mm. famous Ash conformity experiments that I think were done at Yale in the 60s uh, really demonstrate that. But social media, as it's designed, promotes and, and it makes available the features of conformity bias to be used in different ways. Like it makes that surface area of human persuasion available for bad actors to steer. Um, I don't know if this is resonating with you, but for me, it, it's like, it's the design decisions inside of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. It doesn't have to work that way. But what people don't see is that those actors, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, are trapped in an arms race for attention. And so the actors that allow you when you comment to get a ton of visibility to other people are offering like a bigger juicy hit of heroin to each person commenting because then I get the reward of I'm high visibility now if I comment. So they're competing for who can give you the maximum visibility. And the same is true with creators. We were talking about this dynamic before that um, what people don't notice or see is that if, if I could use Instagram Reels, uh, which is their video, instant video kind of thing, or I could use TikTok to post a video. And they're basically just two platforms for posting something. Mm. As a person posting, what do I care about? Well, care, I care about getting it, getting it to the most viewers. Mm. So if TikTok just says, we're going to juice you with, we're going to get you even more visibility per video, that's what's going to control where people start to post. Mm. Um, and I think that's another dimension people aren't seeing is that the dynamics of how this is warping creators, mm. um, of how it's juicing you with certain kinds of feedback, um, is also how those companies are themselves at a bigger level trapped in an arms race for attention. There was a great article by Venkatesh Rao about the internet of beefs mm -hmm. where he said that Twitter is kind of replicating a feudal system. And it's fascinating, called the Knights and Mooks. I don't know if you've heard that kind of... Remind me, I remember coming across the article. But... Yeah, so the internet of beefs is basically the internet of... of, of um, Grudge, grudge matches, constant grudge matches all the time between sort of celebrity knights and their mooks who are then sort of like in a foot sort of fealty system. They will kind of argue along predetermined lines uh, determine, as determined by the knights and they will be rewarded occasionally by like a retweet by their celebrity knight or a kind of pat on the head or a like or something. Oh, I see. And, and it was fascinating. He basically said, look, we're replicating a what looks more like a kind of feudal system than any other kind of healthy kind of uh, information ecosystem is right. really um, and it does seem to have had a more it does seem to have, if you look back you can kind of see tendencies in people to be a little bit conspiratorial or to be a little bit reactionary but so many people seem to have under the pressure of these platforms like those particular character parts of their character seem to have become more and more exaggerated um, so I, I have a good example of this uh, that I can share um, I, I watched Russell Brand get massively influenced by his audience. And, and I, I like Russell Brand. I've been on his podcast. I, I like what he was doing a year or two ago. And, um, and then when someone I know, Frances Haugen, who's the Facebook whistleblower, very famous, um, you know, she leaked these thousands of documents that Facebook had had. Um, and I got to know her at the very end of that process, right before she um, went public in the, in the media. Um, and I knew her background. She was like an engineer at Google. She worked in Google Plus. She, she's like an engineer who has a Harvard MBA. Mm -hmm. um, when she came out um, and she did the hearings, there was this conspiracy theory that especially Russell Brand's viewers believed, which was that she was a CIA or government operative because she was a little bit too polished. She was mm -hmm. just a little bit that there was something too nice or too like a just so story mm -hmm. that tech was causing all these problems and that this was all a ploy to justify the government censoring and regulating social media and having control over free speech. This is all like planned upstream, a conspiracy theory in mind, that you know, someone planted Francis and this thing happened. So knowing that I knew Francis and I knew exactly who she is, um, I watched this story, which by the way, I later found out was um, uh, actively um, spread around by Facebook's PR team. Yeah, I thought um, it probably was. As soon as I heard it, I was like, that's really convenient on the other side. Which is interesting because that's the honest conspiracy theory, is that actually Facebook's PR team was spreading the story around. But instead of that, and they, sp they spread it around specifically to right-wing media, who of course don't want or are suspicious of the government regulating speech. And the funny thing was that instead of the conspiracy theorists accurately pointing their finger at Facebook's PR team and being a, a good, like well-grounded one, they're pointing it at um, Francis being a government agent. And um, the comments saying that this was the, the case on Russell Brand's uh, videos 
were so overwhelming about like, you're a muggle if you don't see through this, that she's just a government agent. Um, that he actually later did a follow-up video, which was like really giving tons of, of fuel to the fire mm -hmm. that she was a government agent. And I, I, so in other words, I watched him get really, like he didn't say that originally and he got steered by the YouTube algorithm and the, and the uh, comments mm -hmm. to sort of take that path. And I feel like that scaled up is exactly what we've seen happen to him, happen to Dave Rubin, happen to everybody. Because you get beholden to if your audience, the ones you have to pat, the ones who are also keeping you in check, if, if they say, no, this is the thing we have to look into, if you don't suit their needs, like what's going to happen to your you know, followers? What's going to happen to your account? Yeah. And it's something about how the negative, even when there's not many negative comments, there's something about how we always kind of find those negative comments more salient than the positive ones. As you're saying, and we said this when the social dilemma came out, if you have a hundred positive comments mm. uh, and then one negative comment, where does your attention go? Like if your attention was rational, you would allocate the information you're getting proportional to the comment, the feedback that you're receiving. Mm. But instead, our attention goes not to the 90 or the 100 positive. It goes to the one negative, and then that dominates and then ruminates our yeah. we ruminate on, in our attention. Um, and as you said, like the algorithm also rewards the most cynical take, and so because the most cynical take generally is more engaging, and so it'll usually show up higher in the comments, or people will upvote it more. And I don't know if people are aware, there's a great book called The Merchants of Doubt, which is about the history of um, the sort of doubt industrial complex, that, it, mm -hmm. that an industry that's, that's toxic or extractive or has problems, whether it's tobacco or oil or social media, mm -hmm. will use the tool of doubt, of cynicism, to um, try to dismantle a, like a moving approach to regulate or rein in the problem. Yeah. Tobacco, <clears throat> is it really a problem? Like... You know, can the, is, it, is the science really clear yet? It seems like the science, there's some studies that say yes, or some say say no. I guess we don't really know. Social media, well, it's hard to say. Is polarization really happening? Is it really that addictive? And there's a lot of forces that play on teenage girls. You know, and so for each one of these industries, doubt is, it's interesting because it overlaps with this countercultural, don't trust the mainstream narrative movement, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a good faith version of it. Powerful. It's mimetically powerful. So we have to realize what mimetic tools we're bringing to the table. Now, in a way, I'm almost sensitive about saying all this because you don't want people to be, but it's out there, right? This is the state of affairs that we're now living in, which is that there's a good faith version of cynicism, which is like, I don't think that the case has yet been made that X is true. And I, I want to, in good faith, figure out that. Not, but then there's a bad faith version, which is I'm strategically planting doubt because it will literally nuke a hundred, you know, 99 studies pointing in the positive direction, one pointing in the other way. Well, it's really hard to say if the, if the science is not really clear yet. The earth's on a wobble. Climate change is kind of complicated. Um, and I think people to understand the asymmetry of the power of doubt and cynicism, mm -hmm. uh, is another important dynamic to consider. Yeah. It's kind of, a, I, I see it as a kind of mimetic, a very powerful mimetic attractor, like that kind of almost like nihilistic. And you don't need to persuade something that someone with something else. You just need to kind of demolish. The, the, the sen in, in a way, the demolishing the sense of truth itself is kind of a central exactly. claim. Well, and that's why if you realize that social media will reward cynical statements mm. um, that point out the failures of anything, an individual or an institution. So here's this weird nuanced point. It's both true that our institutions from the post-Bretton Woods World War, you know, post-Bretton Woods order are breaking down and the institutions can't hold the level of complexity of our current society and the exponential tech and how fast things are moving. So it's true that our institutions are not able to move at the pace, speed, and complexity of the issues. Alan Greenspan in 2008 saying, I don't know what happened. My ideology was, was wrong. I don't even know what that means. That's like a good example of the institution broke down, the Yoda on the hill, the, the, the person who's supposed to know the most about this. It's not working. So it's true in general that our institutions are not able to handle the complexity, but they're not all dysfunctional every single day on everything, right? They do. There's important roles that they serve and there's good things that they do do. But with social media, you would be under the impression that every institution is completely dysfunctional and nothing works yeah. because the one time that something goes wrong or someone made a stupid statement or the CDC, not to steal mine and say the CDC is great. They made lots of mistakes during the pandemic. But the one time that any institution does something like that, mm. I'll give you an example from my own uh, work um, to actually talk about the way that personal comments eat at you a little bit. Mm. In The Social Dilemma, um, in the middle of the film, I say, uh, no one ever worried about bicycles. I don't know if you remember this, but I talked about how 
Uh, people didn't worry that bicycles were going to ruin society or democracy. This is not true. People did have a moral panic about bicycles in the 1800s. Um, and I actually knew that. And the way I framed it, it was kind of differently cut. I told Jeff, the director, to take this out of the film. But to make a long story short, um, The Social Dilemma was a mostly very, very popular film that people overwhelmingly agreed with. People took this one thing that I said in the middle of the film uh, that I got wrong, objectively. And they painted that as that, therefore, the entire argument that social media is wrecking democracy, is addicting kids, is screwing up mental health, is, and these are limited versions of, of articulating it. I think it's fundamentally an existential threat to our society functioning at all. Um, but they took that one comment as, and then painted it as if that is all of the legitimacy of the argument of this film. And, and it's just an example of how one cynical, pointing out one cynical thing, um, does not mean that the rest of the picture is, is illegitimate, um, or the rest of the institution is always dysfunctional. So one little ray of hope maybe is that things might be, people are more good faith and are generally good, I think more often than we give credit for, but we are staring at this funhouse mirror. Um, of social media, not a mirror that's reflecting back a neutral image of, well, those are just how many conspiracy theorists already existed in your society. Mm -hmm. It's a funhouse mirror that has amplified the parts of the picture in the mirror that were good for getting attention mm -hmm. and cynicism and outgrouping our fellow countrymen and women and um, nihilism and um, polarization and, you know, salacious stuff. That was all good at getting attention. So we're massively confused by the last 15 year process of deranging our self image. Um, and the point of the social dilemma was to wake people up to that derangement process. And what we're finding out here is that that funhouse mirror was also screwing with creators' brains. Mm. And so one of the interesting things is a lot of people say, well, I don't use social media. Why should I care about any of these things? But you were using or looking at media created by creators or mm. journalists, and journalists got their worldview, their reality umwelt from social media. And this is critical, by the way, with yeah. Elon and Twitter, because um, a lot of people say, well, like, Let's actually size up the networks. Twitter is a fairly small social network compared to YouTube and TikTok and, and Facebook. But Twitter um, is mostly used by the journalists and intelligentsia class. And the, that class um, construct the reality, the articles, the videos, the public statements, the political views um, that the rest of the world lives inside of. So even if you don't live in Twitter, you live in the, in the articles that journalists write on the New York Times paper that you get physically in the mail. And we know that even on um, television media, MSNBC and Fox News producers, they know what to cover by looking at the Twitter trending topics. Yeah. And if Twitter trending topics is looking at the most cynical takes about all these inflammatory cultural fault lines, that, that warps the minds of those who create the material that the rest of the world lives in. So like, what I'm trying to get at is just how deranged the picture we're getting back is. Like, People are a lot better than we see from social media. Mm -hmm. Institutions are more functional, not fully functional, but they're more functional than what we see from social media. And we have to look and discount that doubt had an asymmetrically powerful uh, impact on how we were making sense of the world. So the nihilism and all of that, I think we have to discount that from like waking up from this matrix spell uh, mm -hmm. that's been cast over us. Yeah, I was thinking as well with the point about the the effect on creators. And I think if anyone watching this hasn't seen it, the the series, have you seen the, the film about Dave Rubin, Dave Rubin's Battle of Ideas? No. Really. Um, amazing, amazing piece by a music producer called, uh, goes, the handle is Timber on Toast. Um, incredible piece. It's as good as any, any kind of uh, mainstream legacy documentary I've ever seen. And he just goes through Dave Rubin's content from beginning to end, mm -hmm. sort of uh, beginning when he was had the interview with Sam Harris, and he was kind of saying, "Hey, I'm a liberal who's noticed that the left can be intolerant," right. and then over time, how it, it just got really, really skewed. And it's a it's a brilliant, absolute kind of the case study for audience capture. You can see it. You can see the sly over time. Yeah. Because otherwise, it, it ha we're living inside of the algorithm tilting humanity. Yeah. And when you can't, when you're in it, you can't see it. It's not just the 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 audience dynamics. It's also like because you're you're often funding yourself through Patreon or so. So you're kind of selecting for the most passionate. Right. So you've got this kind of like the audience, the comment thread and the audience, but then you're also selecting for the most passionate. So the people who are fully bought into like Dave Rubin's like rhetoric about there's a war on the left, they're coming for us, they're coming for all of us. And so in, in the end, like those are the people that your kind of your livelihood is dependent on. And also with, with some people who went down like a conspiratorial rabbit hole, you saw the Patreon kind of 
support jump massively right. as well. Because people are going to fund, like, we really want to research that thing. Which, yeah. by the way, let, let's be clear for audiences, we want to yeah. make sure. Uh, we're not using the word conspiracy to paint a bunch of ideas that are not the establishment ideas. So we have to be very thoughtful about we're trying to do high quality sense making, but yeah. there, there is a rewarding of the cynical mind. I think John Verveke has a con, uh, a fr- the hermeneutics of suspicion, the hermeneutics yeah. of suspicion, which is fancy words for it, like the interpreting through the lens of suspicion, just being suspicious of everything all the time. And also noticing that you win social points in your community by being a little bit more suspicious and not falling for the main the main narrative. I was yeah. on a call recently with um, Jonathan Haidt, who wrote this very famous article about how social media has um, uh, evidence for the kinds of damage and polarization and other effects that it's caused. And it was mostly just like everyone really agreed with it. What I found with this call of all these, it's a private call, but with a lot of public intellectuals, and everybody was reflexively kind of suspicious, like, well, I don't really know if there's a problem. And I'm just thinking, man, we're just, we're just so trapped in this, this suspicious uh, view. Yeah, I really find that useful. I don't think John came up with the hermeneutics of suspicion, but... Oh, that's right. He references um, someone else. He references someone else. Uh, but it's a very, very smart and I find very informative framework of like we're trapped. And America in particular, like coming from the UK and seeing, it feels like you guys are, are further down, like the metricization, the capture of 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 the of the information landscape seems further advanced in America. Seems, the fragmentation seems deeper. In the UK, there's still a little bit more coherence to the conversation. We're still, we're still, yeah, th- things are, are, not, are not great there as well. Yeah. But at the same time, it feels like the the tendrils of all of these kind of incentive structures, the corporate kind of, yeah, the corp- the warping effects of all of these dynamics seems more advanced, and that kind of seems to manifest as the hermeneutics of suspicion mm-hmm. eating itself, like. Mm-hmm. That where where it's kind of constantly devouring almost the ground that it's sitting on, which seems part of that same dynamic because it's totally. rewarding. Like, ah, oh, I I see the truth of of this. Like, you're all you're already the I see the truth of this because every one of those statements externalizes distrust into society. We used to have this sort of battery of trust, and every time we express suspicion and we get points for that. If you pay me 10 points every time I sus- express suspicion and you pay me negative two points for just going along with the mainstream narrative, mm. then what is that system going to look like if I just hit play and just watch the whole game play out? Mm. It's going to deplete the battery of trust every time people are expressing that way. Another thing you and I were talking about um, uh, before this was, we call it trauma inflation or wound inflation. Mm. So if you think about the attention economy as not rewarding what people want, but what you can't look away from. So the, what gets our attention is the master metric. And um, if you had an AI that was looking at where people look when they're driving down a freeway, if, if everyone's looking at the car crashes, the AI would say, I guess the world just loves car crashes. And it would start feeding you car crashes based on the assumption that attention, where attention goes, is what we want. So we break that assumption. But um, another place that our attention goes is places that we're already traumatized by. So during Black Lives Matter, if you were a person who experienced police brutality, and you're, you, when you click on one of those videos, and from an account that's posting more of those videos, obviously that's a tr- that's like a re-traumatizing experience, and you're going to click and probably follow the accounts of some of the, vid- the accounts that were posting those videos. When you do that, you're going to see more and more and more and more and more videos of the thing that is actually re-traumatizing your nervous system to that harm. Um, and meanwhile, all the other people... Uh, who, who, when you say there's just so much police brutality, what they see on the, on the anti-group for that, they see examples of people talking about police brutality that wasn't police brutality or like overreach or the left being too sensitive or calling things that have nothing to do with like brutality, brutality because someone used a different word or something like that. So their newsfeed is filled with the maximum cynicism of that thing. And this other person's newsfeed is filled with the maximum tra- traumatic um, experience of that thing. And then when this person says something to this person, they're at a, a knife's edge of their own nervous system mm. because they're emotionally triggered. Mm. How does someone who's traumatized respond to being accused they, that their experience is like not real? Mm. I mean, you're going to lash out. And then that externalizes even more hate at each other in society. Mm. And I think that um, we have trauma inflation and empathy deflation at the same time because of the personalization of the news feeds. I, I had a friend who's um, Asian American mm. and... Um, and she had a lot of uh, harassment and um, uh, she, I think, got really, you, I could watch her going down the rabbit hole of Asian American hate. And at the time, I was 
I don't know, I was kind of just browsing news casually over those months and I didn't see like a massive uptick in Asian American hate. But then I was thinking about from her perspective, she clicked on one example of that and then the keywords that go along with that and then following accounts of people who posted things like that. And you start to see more and more and more examples of, again, that dynamic. And then you start to feel like this is a real phenomenon. And it is. You're seeing the preponderance and evidence of the thing. Meanwhile, on the outside, if you're not Asian or you don't have those experiences, um, and I'm not just doing the kind of left thing, but like you just aren't seeing those videos. And I just think it's so easy to overlook the degree of perception gap that we're not in the same reality. I know people say that all the time, but you have to really embody like just how different the last 15 years of overwhelming evidence of whatever it is you think is happening in the world. It's just so different than what everyone else has seen. Yeah, I think your phrase, frame of trauma inflation, is a really, really valuable concept to get. And the recent example that I saw was the the Johnny Depp Amber Heard right. case, which was absolutely fascinating to watch because, um, and, and there is something about, by definition, we are going to be kind of attracted by our attention is going to go towards the places where we're wounded, where we're hurt. And what I noticed with that with that case was I saw people going to war on Facebook, for example, on both sides. And the specific examples that I was aware of I knew that the Team Johnny or Team Amber or whatever were people that I know have had like really difficult experiences with the opposite sex. So it was women who'd been in difficult, abusive relationships, sided with, sided with Amber Heard, and that was their kind of, that, that was, I saw them kind of just really going to war over it. And then on the other side, like Team Johnny, another couple of guys who'd been involved with like really narcissistic partners in the past. And it was just so clear, like the people who were really passionate about it, it was their own rationale, it was their own kind of personal story that had kind of led them to, to that position. It was like the kind of re-traumatizing effect of, of social media. And then that, that trial was also kind of weaponized with like the, the small clips for kind of for each side, for each side as yeah, well. Exactly. Um, and, and there again, you have the preponderance of evidence because like yeah. you just see video after video after video of like things that are in favor of the confirma- confirmation bias that you hold. It's almost like instead of confirmation bias, there's like trauma confirmation bias, which is an extra deep form of that confirmation bias because it reifies a deep wound that we've experienced. And we're just likely to see that, you know? Yeah. We're talking about with the Weinstein uh, brothers, who, who I would call friends. Uh, I haven't seen them in a while. But, um, you know, I know that their family, I think Eric's talked about this publicly, he has a history of I think the CIA was like following their father, who was, I think, connected to the Communist Party or something like that at the time. I don't, there was some connection where the government actually did have some kind of, you know, spying or disrupting of, of, mm. of their family. And so when that's running in your nervous system as the baseline way that you're, um, relating to the world, I'm not trying to just, I'm not trying to dismantle anything that they said. That's a whole other topic. Um, people can, can have their views. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, I just think these are other examples of, we should, we need to be aware of what we're bringing to the table in our sense mm-hmm. making. I think so much of what you're trying to do with this channel yeah. is how do we improve our collective sense making? Mm-hmm. Part of that is like, what are the tools that we can use? But part of it is notice that we're, we're like right now picking up a pair of binoculars to look out at the world mm-hmm. that gives us this totally warped, distorted, opposite, upside down view of reality. Mm-hmm. And so we can try to improve our internal tools, but we should also probably not pick up that mm-hmm. pair of binoculars. And I'll say a couple of just last things. There's a group called um, More in Common. Mm-hmm. Actually, there's a group, they have a branch in the UK and a branch in the US. Mm-hmm. And they do polling on um, what different political tribes think the other tribe believes. Mm-hmm. So for example, if you ask Democrats, what percentage um, of Republicans be- would you estimate agree with the statement that racism is is still a problem in the United States today. And Democrats from looking at their Twitter feed and just seeing all these, you know, the right just saying this is ridiculous, would assume that only 25% of Republicans would agree that racism is still a problem. The actual answer is closer to 70%. Um, We we interviewed the director, Dan Vallone, on on our podcast um, called More in Common. (laughs) Uh, Sorry, called um, Your Undivided Attention, excuse me. Um, And uh, what they found consistently in their research is that um, the more you use social media, the worse you are at estimating uh, what other people believe. So you think of the other way around. 
if I use social media more, I'm more informed than my peers. I'm like the guy who's reading the newspaper. I'm totally informed about these issues. It's the exact opposite. The more you use it, because you're exposed to the extreme filtered view of reality, you're seeing um, a distorted view that makes you believe uh, more and more incorrect things about what the other tribe is, is believing. Another funny example is that if you ask Republicans, what percentage of Democrats are LGBTQ? And they will estimate more than a third of Democrats are LGBTQ because of how often that's represented and the voices represented on Twitter. But in fact, only 6% of Democrats are LGBTQ. So on both sides, we are just living in this funhouse mirror. And I think a good example, by the way, of a humane form of, of media would be that the more I use it, the, the uh, smaller my perception gaps get, meaning the better I am at assessing what other people believe. Um, so I think that's actually an inspiring idea of how it could work and what it should look like. Um, and also naming the problem, which is like, you can't live in a democracy when the more you use media, the worse you are at estimating what other people believe. Yeah. And then getting into fights with them, like a phantom, like you're beating up a ghost. That's not the real version. It's yeah. a very small percentage. It's been magnified in your binoculars. Yeah. That's, uh, really interesting. And it kind of, it develops the idea of filter bubbles, uh, a little yeah. bit more. So Jamie Bartlett, who works on similar topics in the UK, Are you familiar with his work? And the name rings a bell. He, he was part of the Center for Social Media at Demos. I think he was the head of the Center of, uh, at Demos for a while. I interviewed him about his Crypto Queen podcast, and we're talking about kind of this, this topic. And he said, the idea of filter bubbles is incorrect because... The so the, the common concept we have is that you're not exposed to the other side. He said yeah, it's that, that it's the opposite. You're exposed to the worst possible version exactly right. of the other side's yeah. arguments. So it's actually exactly that thing. And by the way, here's another example where those who, because I'm living in the <laughs> social media as an existential threat to democracy space, mm. um, people will look at those studies as the um, different definition of filter bubble, that it's just mm. showing you information from your side, which it's not. They'll use the studies that show that that's not true to dismantle the broader argument that social media is breaking democracy and causing polarization and does have a form of filter bubble, but it's a different definition of filter bubble. Mm. It's not that it's showing you only information from your side. It's that it shows you the worst of the, of the other side and information that, that confirms a lot of things you believe. Yeah, sort of most radicalizing content from the other side, effectively. Yeah. Um, the concept of nut picking, I think, is kind of... Nut picking, that cherry picking? Yeah, nut picking is is literally like the nuttiest examples of the other side. Oh, yeah, so exactly. It's a kind of nut nut picking strategy of just showing you kind of the worst. That's um, a nice um, meme. Yeah, I guess the question that I have is, like, YouTube is the one that I'm kind of most exposed to, and it's sort of the one that I feel that there's the least uh, alternative platforms. Like, there aren't so many alternative like long form video platforms, mm -hmm. but it does seem that there could be some very easy changes to the architecture that would make it more. Like maybe you would have to watch all the way to the end of a video before commenting on it. Like sometimes you kind of put a video up and it's been up for like five minutes and people are already kind of commenting right. on it. And it's like that. Why? Why is that useful? But w what is the reason for YouTube to not have more healthy um, dynamics in the not introduce kind of innovations that would make for a more healthy conversation in the comments thread? Well, to be fair to YouTube, I think that due to a lot of the public criticism and films like The Social Dilemma and whistleblowers like Guillaume Chaslow, who mm -hmm. actually worked on the YouTube recommendation system inside of Google and then came out and blew the whistle saying this recommendation engine causes uh, rabbit holes, due to this, this increase in public awareness, I think YouTube has worked tremendously on trying to detoxify YouTube comments. It's gotten a little bit better. I don't know. I'm not actually following it um, that closely, but I know that they're trying to make investments. Now, those investments are often language-based and classifier-based, and so it often means that English or French or German, the countries that can regulate these companies, those get better first. But working on, you know, countries like Sri Lanka or Ethiopia or Myanmar or, you know, those countries aren't going to get the attention that the other ones are. So if you think about the toxicity, the most toxic versions of these things are used by the developing world. So much like climate change, where the developing world gets the worst of it, um, because of economic, pure economic reasons, these companies won't invest in detoxifying, mm. uh, in language specific ways, at least in the developing world, as much as they do in the six countries or whatever that can kind of regulate it. Mm. So that's one aspect. I think that the comments have gotten, um, slightly better or whatever. I want to name another thing, which kind of relates to our previous piece of the conversation. There's other research saying 
YouTube rabbit holes is also, there's like academic studies. YouTube rabbit holes is not a thing. Like it's not actually causing people to go to more extreme content. I would say, I agree. That's because people like our community of whistleblowers and friends who've been trying to raise a lot of alarm about this mm. were yelling about it from, you know, 2016, 17, 18. And I think starting in 2018, they started, um, improving it. So it's less of the kind of, you know, you click on one moon landing video and then you're in the flat earth world and you click mm. on one, um, I don't even know, Bill Clinton video and you get fully into Epstein world, you know, so it's not, not that these are all wrong or anyway, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> but, uh, the extreme rabbit hole thing that YouTube used to do and did do, mm. it's gotten lower. Which has kind of made, made Alex Jones, because this is, this is the other thing that to, to factor in is that certain types of content is much more ener energetically attractive or emotionally attractive. Yes. And, and, Extreme conspiracy content, it's something, close. something like QAnon, which is like, if you genuinely believe there's a cabal of kind of children kidnapping pedophiles, yeah. that is the most kind of, um, emotionally triggering content you could possibly imagine if you really believed it, which is why, incidentally, I think they found that it's mostly attractive to middle-aged women. I think a lot of hmm. the QAnon content has oh, been really? kind of, yeah. Um, this is why we call it the, the race to the bottom of the brainstem, because yes. it's just the race into more and more innovative ways of activating your limbic system. Yeah. And the hermeneutics of suspicion or child pedophiles or there's a million areas of, of nuance here. But just to notice the intrinsic um, salacious quality to like what activates my limbic system mm. is fear, anger, su suspicion. Um, the idea of like that the world is run by this like global elite that's like, mm. you know, and of course there's a tiny partial truth to some of these things. Mm. Um, but they get overblown. Um, but I wanted to say one other thing about the YouTube yeah. recommendation system. So even though that they no longer do the extreme rabbit holes, mm. now think about YouTube. It's competing for what? What's YouTube's business model? How much have you paid for your YouTube account recently? Mm, not much. Right. I mean, yeah. maybe you pay for YouTube premium. I, you, so I do have YouTube premium. I so do too, actually, for the offline eight, use. Eight, eight, eight pounds a month or something. Whatever that is. But most people, it's mm. free. But yet YouTube is, is making billions of dollars for Google. Mm. So how is that true? Well, they're selling our attention. As we said in The Social Dilemma, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Your attention is the product. Mm. And YouTube is competing for attention not with just other video sites. What people don't understand is that YouTube is just competing for attention. When I talked to product managers at Facebook, they said that their biggest, biggest competitor, this is in 2010, their biggest competitor was YouTube, not Twitter or some of their social network, because it wasn't about the category. It was just about attention, raw attention. And values blind attention means that you do time whatever it takes. Time on site. Yeah. Getting engagement time, the number of sessions, the amount of time per session, how much you come back, repeat usage. By the way, this is also why comments got out of control. Because if I do, if I invent the comments feature, suddenly I have a hundred more reasons to send you an email per day because every time someone comments on your thing, I'm going to send you a new email or a new post, which is a new trap door that got you from your email application back into YouTube. And now you're sucked into YouTube again. And so all this like social feedback, more comments, more likes, more rewards. If I can invent a new kind of social feedback, I would because it'll be more effective at getting you to come back. This is how the race for attention is actually the bigger structure that's controlling what even these platforms do and don't do. So I wanted just to elevate the discussion, which is recently in the U.S., TikTok has taken over in time spent from YouTube and from Facebook. I don't know the exact number, but recently they've surpassed them. So now in the race to the bottom of the brainstem, you know, whatever the short bursty dopamine one marshmallow society videos of TikTok are out competing these long form things. Think about a brand like Ted, which is or a brand like yours, which is based on the YouTube recommendations. Would TED exist of these 18 minute videos if everybody spent all of their time on TikTok? So the economics of TED as a conference depend on TED Talks being powerful. That's gonna die if people start moving all of their video watching time to these short form uh, platforms. So that forces all these other platforms to compete and start products like Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts, and now they're competing in the same form factor of like you scroll and they give you another one and another one and another one. And where I'm going here is that original thing I said about um, YouTube rabbit holes and extremism. Mm. So we said that they solved that problem. In a values-blind attention economy, they added a values eyeball called toxicity. And they tried to be better at recommending people not towards more toxic stuff. Mm. But they added that into their um, the recommended video system. They didn't add that into this new product called YouTube Shorts, which that thing has to compete with TikTok. So they're just doing, let's take all the guardrails off, mm. maximum 
whatever's going to get you, keep you scrolling to the next three second video. Mm -hmm. And when I was using it just the other day, it steered me totally down in this, in this case, specifically a right wing rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. And it was like all the worst, most aggressive, bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and my point there is that as the arms race for attention gets more intense, we can't just say, Oh yeah, we're done. YouTube cleaned up recommended videos. Mm -hmm. They're trapped in another arms race that forces them into more and more unregulated um, recommendations of just the more extreme stuff. Mm -hmm. So I just want to show people that it's not over. Like the, the race continues because the next platform that goes to a one second video mm -hmm. or, you know, gives you a bigger dose of like social heroin of like, you've got even more likes and followers than on the other platform. They're going to keep getting sucked into that race unless we change the dynamics. Mm. There's something as you were talking that um, struck me. I've kind of thought about it before a little bit, but, and you have to, you have to kind of frame this because when you talk about conspiracy, and I know you kind of had the same feeling of like, yeah, it's, a, it. Hold on, it's, like su it's such it. yeah. an overloaded term. Like, right. I think you need to have, I've said this a few times before, but it's so overloaded because it's like, well, clearly there are some conspiracies. Clearly there are people who collaborate together in secret and they have agendas and yes. some of the conspiracies in the past have turned out to be true. Absolutely true. 100%. But there is something that I would term kind of all encompassing conspiracy that is the sort of like the QAnon, which means you don't need to think about it anymore. You just slot it into a pre-existing. Um, Jamie Wheel called it malevolent design. Uh -huh. It's sort of like there's a kind of like there's a pattern. There's a something that was put together and it's a coordinated by a group of people. And it's like in kind of the more extreme like QAnon versions of the cabal or there is a certain group of people coordinating. It. That's a different thing. It's, yeah. it's sort of it's an all encompassing conspiracy theory. Um, Rene de Resta calls it like a, a meta conspiracy theory because they all start to fit together into this meta theory that yeah. it's all, and there's people who like chart this all out or whatever. But. Yeah. But the, why I, I, I have a feeling, I wonder whether part of the feeling of the, the attraction towards something like that is the feeling of being manipulated at all times. Because in a way, like there is an all encompassing conspiracy theory for our attention and for our, right. um, like we are being manipulated all the time by by the very kind of infrastructure that we're using it, which in a way that would lead to the sort of pattern recognition of like, well, who's coordinating it? Right. Well, I mean, that's if I steel man, those who engage in that kind of epistemology of how do we know what we know, mm. they're often what they're doing is like, thank God for the conspiracy theorists who point out wherever there's a perverse incentive, like wherever there's someone who profits from X. Yeah. Like that's what they're doing. They're saying, Hey, by the way, notice, let's notice in the situation who's profiting from X. Yeah. And that's a really good thing to notice. Qui bono. What's that? Qui bono. What is that? Um, it's the Latin for who benefits. Who benefits. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So I think, and that's, that's an important aspect of sense making. I think the challenge is when it, it actually like rotates your entire sense making mm. through the lens of everything is manipulation and control all the time. And notice the externalities in your own being that arise from feeling and being mm. and, and acting from that place every single day. Mm. Notice what happens to how you relate to other people. You start feeling like they don't see that everything is a manipulator. Like there's this whole um, shift in being mm. that I think shows up in people. Yeah. And and um, some research I was going to cite uh, when you're mentioning the meta theory, Renee, my colleague Renee Diresta, who studies um, the um, growth and virality and spread of different conspiracy theories. Uh, She's done that work for a while and people should check it out. But I think she cites this, this statistic that, um, or this, this study that said the best predictor of whether you would believe in a new conspiracy theory was whether you already believed in one, mm -hmm. because that set the stage for a hermeneutics of suspicion. We now have that language to give it. I think we spoke last time shortly after or shortly before the social dilemma yeah. came out. Um, and I wonder how you feel things have changed since then. Cause I know you said that it was, a significant moment in, in the conversation around it, at least. Yeah. So we estimate, we don't have the firm numbers. Netflix released the early numbers that net, that the social dilemma was seen by 38 million households in the first, I think it was three or four weeks. And that was during COVID. So per household, that was multiple people. We estimate that at least 120 million uh, people in 190 countries and in 30 languages saw the social dilemma. Um, I think it's had an enormous impact in a bunch of invisible ways. Um, it is now basically required part of the curriculum at like any high school, any college. I'm very proud to say that I think that um, you probably won't go through high school or college without getting exposed to that and hopefully creating a more immune system to social media for kids. Um, 
Uh, it has been required viewing of the Air Force uh, Academy, uh, and and the U.S. military chief of staff recently put it on the reading list for the whole U.S. military. That's actually, by the way, because radicalization in the military is a huge problem from, I think, the way that social media works per our conversation. We've seen the rise of many more whistleblowers coming out, most notably Francis Haugen, um, uh, who, um, you know, for those who don't know, basically shared 2,000 or something pages of Facebook research um, providing evidence and, and receipts for the kinds of things we're talking about, polarization, mental health problems for kids, the way that it rewards the most extreme voices. It's all in great detail. And yeah. she came out with that. Since her disclosures, Facebook stock price has dropped by um, more than half, actually. Um, and that was before the recent market turn. So just I would say just the impact of those disclosures, plus recently Apple um, in the last year launched these privacy protecting features that you can say, do not track. I don't give consent for this app to track me. Those features, when Tim Cook, um, the CEO of Apple, launched them, said we cannot allow a social dilemma to become a social catastrophe. Um, so those ch ch uh, changes have actually taken down $10 billion a year from Facebook's revenue. Um, we have seen more people inside these companies say we don't want to actually create those problems. So I'd say there's more consciousness in the industry. Um, we have seen attorney generals uh, from uh, many states uh, launch the first uh, consumer harm and deception uh, uh, lawsuit for uh, Instagram and I believe TikTok are hurting the mental health of, of kids. So if you think about the big tobacco, how did big tobacco change? You've seen attorney generals that filed this 50 state lawsuit that basically said big tobacco was deceiving and harming and giving lung cancer to people and actively deceived those people about it. And that created a remedy, which was the whole truth campaign and ongoing funding and, per and PSAs to try to educate the public to not use uh, tobacco. I think something similar like that could happen here. I think there's much more for Apple to do. The, um, the incoming salaries for people at Facebook, I've heard, has had to triple in, in incoming costs. So if you think about it as a cost center, mm -hmm. I would just say that the consciousness of the world has shifted. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to claim that it's all the social dilemma. There's so many different nonprofits and groups that work mm -hmm. in this space. Um, we're just one of them. But I do think that it helped. What we're proud of is the way that it catalyzed impact in, in all these different domains. There's also parents who are doing private litigation for frankly, teen suicide. They've lost their children and there's more um, more there, including, by the way, California state legislation, the age-appropriate design code in the UK and something copying that in um, in California state. So there's... What I, what I have to say about this, David, is that like, uh, when I think about the grand scope of the world, like things are still on fire and these platforms are still operating the brain implant of our democracy and our society. And they're still giving our society like kind of a combination of Tourette's, ADHD, and Alzheimer's. And it's screwing up our sense making. And that still exists. But um, I think if, if you would have told me that all those things would have ever happened, you know, six years ago, uh, I would have never believed you. And um, I just think it's it, what I have to hope for is that the rate of change will continue to go up because I None of those things in Francis Haugen and um, Apple changing their features and, you know, all these things I would have never expected to happen. So um, that's at least a little bit of hope that things keep moving somehow faster than than we anticipated. Yeah, it's definitely true that the, the conversation around it shifted in a similar way to how it shifted around drink driving in the 70s or about um, smoking probably in the 60s. Mm -hmm. There is definitely like pretty much everyone now is aware that these these tools have this effect. Yeah. Um, interestingly, I kind of wonder about it from the other side. I've been talking to uh, Peter Lindbergh about, he's come up with the concept of like, or popularized the concept of the second self. Mm. And how can we have a more mindful relationship to the second self, which is the self that we put online. So it would be our digital avatar, our second self. Yeah. yeah, like what are the failure conditions of those, of those platforms, like the internalized capitalism of always wanting to kind of up the metrics or... Uh, the performativeness of, of them or um, audience capture dynamics, like all of these things, and how do we create sort of a more mindful relationship. So I'm interested as well because we have sort of shared interest in kind of developmental thinking and maybe some of the more you mentioned in the last conversation about treating attention as something sacred. So there's sort of some sense of like the sacredness or the um, spiritual dimension of this of this conversation, for want of a better word. Um, is your do you because I've I've always thought that there has to be a kind of inner chain shift in in our kind of 
awareness of how these platforms are kind of preying on our narcissism or preying on our kind of uh, different kind of psychological tendencies. Is it always an is it always a kind of um, an unbalanced arms race between the two? Do you think that there is some some hope? Uh, and how much do you think the the role of that kind of inner development, inner awareness plays in the kind of dynamic between that and social media? Um, well, we need to develop a bigger immune system to the arms race for attention, for sure. Um, I would say there's two there's two kind of areas of this in, in magic tricks. Maybe I talked about this last time. Um, in neuroscience, there's a there's a phrase called um, something that is cognitively impenetrable. Um, and Neil Seth, I think, is the neuroscientist who popularized this. And that's the idea that even if I tell you, don't think of an elephant, and of course you think of an elephant, um, and I tell you about that effect, you, you still can't escape the effect. If I show you the optical illusion where there's the checkerboard and there's this two squares that look like they're different colors because the shadow is like moving on one of the squares. I don't know if you've seen this. You can put it up on screen. Um, peop, you can tell people that those are in fact the same color and your eye is doing a weird optical illusion. But even though I tell you that that's happening, it doesn't change the effect. Even if I tell you that you have a hundred comments and only one of them was negative, and that our minds have a negativity bias and yeah. we will, our mind will go to the one. Dude, that doesn't change your mind from doing that the next time. We're still vulnerable to that. But human development, and we were talking earlier about our shared interest in Wilbur and developmental theory, Keegan, all of that. I think the more, um, the more we develop, the less, for example, of a socialized mind that we have, the less that we are making meaning through what socially is acceptable and what other people think. The, the more free we are. And I think social media currently expands the developmental period of when we are socialized, when we are concerned more about what other people think, mm. because it, it, it like occupies that, that surface area and traps us mm. in, in being concerned about what other people think. And even if you're a person who's relatively immune to that, like we've talked about today, I think people get more trapped in that. And that's a developmental diagnosis of how it's kind of stunting us. Where I was going with the, um, cognitive Im impenetrability, is that even if you tell people how all these dynamics work, that awareness won't change that much our relationship to it. And I don't want people to feel powerless because of that. I just want to recognize it's sort of like we need to live in an environment where the solutions actually match what needs to be changed. Like if the solution to climate change was that Exxon appointed a sustainability council, like that's not going to change climate change. Exxon is still the business of Exxon. If Facebook's solution to itself and YouTube is to appoint a responsibility council. That's not a solution. They're still trapped in the arms race for attention. If a cigarette company says, oh yeah, we'll help you stop smoking. We'll add a pencil to the cigarette box and we'll show you, uh, we'll, we'll put a little streaks thing on the side that lets you mark the number of days you haven't smoked on the cigarette box. That would not be a real solution to not smoking. Mm -hmm. It's putting the solution at the wrong place mm -hmm. in the pipeline of the problem. So I think the, the key is that um, we, we have to both increase the immunity of the patient that's being kind of torn apart by this cancer cell. We have to actively weaken the cancer cell and drain it of resources. Mm -hmm. And we need alternatives or DNA transitioning the cancer cell into something that's not a cancer, but something that's regenerative, humane, mindful. Um, but to do that, you first need the awareness. That's why I think the social dilemma and this, this common awareness that people have uh, is critical for that. It's important to realize that Tim Cook couldn't have announced those features at Apple mm -hmm. that blocked that, um, that, that protected your privacy, um, uh, and especially harmed social media companies without the social dilemma. Because if they did it before that, it would have been looking, it would have looked like an abuse of their market power, that mm -hmm. it's an antitrust move. There's a bad mm -hmm. faith interpretation of that is like Apple just wants more money and they want to crowd out these other guys. Um, and what we need is the awareness that says this category of race to the bottom of the brainstem dynamics are always going to yield a more addicted, outraged, polarized, narcissistic, and misinformed society because those things are all good for getting attention. And if we can put a price tag on that business model that um, we can't afford, then we can, we can move away from it. And we need that public awareness so that Apple and others can do more in the future. Um, hope that makes sense. Tristan, thank you. Great to do this with you, David.